Welcome to another edition of Buffalo Camp Day Recap. I'm Thad Brown along with A.J. Feldman. Two days of camp now in the books. We are not uh, tired of it yet. It's not the dog days of camp. It was it also is... like 73 degrees today. Oh, it was great. You're right. We'll take this every single day. Super breezy, too. This is probably about as comfortable as you can get in terms of training camp in late July at St. John Fisher. It was a relatively quiet day of camp, mm -hmm. too. Um, it felt like the offense was doing some extended or extended might not be the right word, but more condensed short condensed formations shorter throws um some wide receiver screen stuff nothing that was too spectacular there were some balls down the field and we'll get to that in a little bit but it wasn't like yesterday where they did red zone the whole day and we had all these spectacular highlights to talk about i think though the thing that i do want to start with yesterday we talked about two receivers that bills fans are really hoping are big parts of this offense today it was the part of this receiving game that I think Bills fans expect to be a big part of the offense and that's Curtis Samuel. Yeah the first one Curtis Samuel he had two really nice plays uh, you know a handful of catches otherwise one of them a really nice seam route down the field kind of in the later half of practice Josh Allen dropped it in a bucket the coverage was great on that play too so you know, kind of a good play all around. I think everybody in that exchange is happy with what they did there, even was, the defense, even though they gave up yeah, the catch. Yeah, great coverage, great throw, great catch, the whole deal. Yeah, and then uh, another one, Curtis Samuel had, um, you know, a couple plays that sitting down the zone. Um, uh, we're, he, we're, he looked like he what he was supposed to be. Yeah. You know, it looked like the veteran who could find a hole in the zone. He looked like a guy that can be dangerous after the catch. Had the ball down the field, which frankly is not necessarily his calling card. The one you talked about at the start of our discussion with Samuel. Yeah, and the other one, he was coming across the the middle on a deeper pass. And there that was too. that was a great Josh Allen play too, because Allen stepped up in the pocket and was kind of leaning as if he was going to run right and then came and threw the ball back across to his left to Samuel running left away from him. And Josh Allen did a Josh Allen thing, which was take that pass, which you're not supposed to be able to connect on, and put it right in the breadbasket. And that's kind of the thing people have been talking about. Curtis Samuel, the last couple of years, the quarterback play really hasn't been there. So if you can get him as an elite quarterback like Josh Allen, you know, his production, you would think, just naturally rises up. And we saw a little of that today in and training camp. I, and I think it depends on how many – targets he gets obviously I think Samuel you know will be a big part of this offense someone on Twitter uh, asked me last night where would I rank the receivers in terms of receptions not yards but receptions and, and I answered with Kincaid one Samuel two and then a gap and then Shakir and Coleman three four three threes very close to each other so I, I think Samuel has a good opportunity to be you know a very integral part of this offense and it was funny day one you really didn't see a lot from him. And today I was watching and, and thinking, wow, it seems like he's on the second team a little bit, not getting many reps. And then the moment after I thought that, it was catch, 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 deep play. And, oh, okay, that's why they went out and spent all that money on Samuel in the offseason. Yeah, I don't know if I see as big of a gap between uh, Shakir and, and uh, Sam in terms of receptions. It's probably just going to depend on how they want to use them because I think both of them can do the jobs that they need to get those receptions. Just kind of depends on who they want to do what in that offense. Would not stun me if that was the case at all. Another receiver we want to talk about today is not a guy that's really on anybody's radar to be mm -hmm. an impactful part of this offense, but I will tell you he will be, and that's Mac Hollins, who everybody's enjoyed watching him run out, <laughs> bare feet, kind of t-shirt and whatever disheveled state it might be. Today it was he it looked like he like pulled a drape off the off the <laughs> the curtains off the rod and, and just threw it over his shoulder and ran out with that tatters everywhere. But he made a couple catches today, had a couple catches yesterday, and look, Mac Hollins is probably the best run blocking receiver the Bills have right now so he is going to have a role there's there's virtually no chance that Mac Hollins doesn't make this team as a part of the the passing game is the question and look he's been effective he had a, a pretty good year with the Raiders two three years back he's not going to be a guy that's going to catch 80 balls for a thousand yards but can he be 50 for 600 can he be a, a very valuable supporting piece kind of I think what the Bills wanted Trent Shurfield to be last year I think it's possible yeah he's going to be a little bit of a mix of Trent Shurfield and Gabe Davis obviously Gabe Davis a really good uh run blocker so maybe Holland's not at that level yet but he's pretty close he's actually yeah. a really really good run blocking receiver but certainly Hollins is a guy who, if you're, you know, just kind of tuning into your, to your bill season, you're like, okay, we signed Curtis Sam, we've got Keon Coleman. Those are our guys, Shakir. No, you're going to need to know the name Matt Hollins. I he's agree. probably going to get a lot more snaps than you expect, and you're going to look at his snap numbers, and he's gonna be like, well, what is he doing out there? Well, he's doing the stuff that you need to do to have a successful offense, run down the field, you know, 
be in the run block, and, and he's going to be a, a, a sizable part of this offense. I think this is going to be a theme throughout is people not realizing how important Hollins is going to be because he's also – generally always on the first team. Like there hasn't been very few times where he's on the second team getting passes from Trubisky in, you know, warmups. He's a first team guy. And I've been comparing him to a guy that would land somewhere between Jay Kumaro and Gabe Davis. And the problem with Kumaro is that he was just wasn't enough of a threat down the field to make teams worry that, well, what if he doesn't run block? What are we going to do? Mac Collins not only is a better just receiver, but he's also a fast guy. He's got, his speed is one of his weapons. So if he can be at least the threat that teams have to respect, it makes the Bills and his ability to run block that much more effective. And, right. Al, and Alan was talking yesterday afterwards. Uh, Post-practice, he was doing some like individual one-on-one -on -one drills, drills with him. Said he couldn't throw the ball high enough. It's like impossible to overthrow this guy in the end zone. He's got to get literally used to throwing to a guy that big who can jump that high. Coleman kind of the same route, but there's going to be some different guys this year. Quick hits from today's practice. Um, number one, I'll start with a negative. Not a huge deal, but Keon Coleman had a, a pretty bad drop today. It was a short slant. He was wide open. Um, this should be an easy pitch and catch. The ball kind of got on him a little too fast, it seemed like. He never quite had control of it. DeMar Hamlin then knocked the ball away and ended up on the ground. Might have been a fumble. Was a, a, at worst or, or at best an incomplete pass. He didn't really make many other plays. He did have a couple catches. It was one drop, and after the, the good hands display he had yesterday, not a worry, but it was notable like, that this was a basic play, and he did not make it today. Yeah, and this wasn't really the, the pra practice for Keon Coleman. Correct. You know, yesterday was red zone. Today it's, you know, starting at the 30-yard line, a lot of short passes. He did have some decent moments where he, you know, he did what he was supposed to do, found his spot, some professional receiver type of things. But, no, not, not the best practice for Keon Coleman. On top of that, um, let's see. Connor McGovern is something you want to talk about again. Connor McGovern again. Um, this time it was not a shotgun snap. It was under the center. He and Allen had an exchange. You can never really tell exactly whose fault at fault is that. I think generally the textbook is it's usually the quarterback getting out too early. So I don't want to pin this on Connor McGovern. But once again, another time where we have a quarterback center issue. Checking it off another day. If you didn't watch us yesterday, yeah. Connor McGovern. But you said there were three that were three, three, three bad ones, shotgun snaps. One bounced its way there. The other one was right on the ground. The other one was like at his knees. So uh, two days where your eyebrows are raised a little bit. How about things that pop for you today on the, uh, the positive side? We got some turkey burgers coming up later on. But, uh, you know, again, it was a, a quiet practice. One thing I do want to note is uh, Kyer Elam got some re uh, reps today on the first team. Mike Edwards had his first practice at camp where he was almost exclusively playing with the first team safeties. Elam's been fine. And, you know, we were uh, kind of joking as we were watching practice between Elam and DeMar Hamlin. You know, which guy who I think has kind of um, been dismissed as a factor on this team could actually have an impact because DeMar Hamlin's had a pretty solid start to camp, made a play yesterday in red zone, had another one today we just mentioned on the Keon drop. He was a part of making sure that ball did not end up being completed. Hamlin's fighting for the fourth safety role, same job he had last year. I think Elam's pretty locked in as the third corner. He's going to make the team. But in terms of actually being on the field and having an impact, to me, they're, they're almost neck and neck right now. Yeah, and, and Hamlin certainly has the wider range of, I think, possibilities, barring an injury. You know, if everybody stays healthy, he's a guy who, who knows? I mean, he got the first day, the first day starting reps. It very well could be that Mike Edwards takes the number one reps the rest of the way. We'll see exactly what happens the rest of camp. But it's not unfeasible that he is a starting safety. He was, you know, it, it would surprise us, but still. Or he could drop down to fourth or fifth. So the range of possibilities for Hamlin, I think, is a lot bigger than, uh, uh, than Elam for sure. I think it'd be hard for him to land a starting job. He certainly can be off the team. But, you know, could, could he be in front of Cole Bishop as the third safety? Mm -hmm. And, and the rookie really has not done anything to impress, only two practices in. But, um, and so it's really early. But Hamlin could end up the third safety, you know. And, and then at that point, there are times that the third safety can come into, there are sub packages that you may want to use them for. So I think it's possible. Certainly, Elam has the more red carpeted ride to have an impact. But to see these two guys both have impacts, Elam wasn't, you know, noticeable today, but it certainly had a great spring has been a little fascinating that I think most fans, maybe not Elam, but there's been 
a lot of discussion about whether these guys really can be functional parts of the secondary. And, and early on, they are putting their name into the, into the ring in terms of potentially having an impact. And McDermott had a comment yesterday about Cole Bishop that maybe implied that Cole Bishop didn't come to camp in the, great sha- in the greatest of shapes. So maybe even more potential for Hamlin to have to step up there. Let's talk more about what was said today, the press conference wrap up. <coughs> Von Miller was uh, the big name after practice who spoke to the media. And AJ, to say the least, he had some news for us today. No, d- definitely uh, a nugget filled uh, press conference, to say the least. He had talked about this before in the offseason about how he said he shouldn't have played last year. Uh, Bills fans are now saying, did you play last year? Um, <laughs> right. But no, uh, Miller was talking about that today where he said he you know, thought he might not have been able to play last year. He just wasn't himself, wasn't able to do the, the things that he expects himself to do. Obviously, he was pretty evident on the tape. He said that today that, you know, should he have sat out? He didn't really think he could be at a age 34 or whatever he is age right now season and take a year and a half off last year and the year before that where he was just going to try and give it a go and no one was going to be able to kind of talk him out of that. And he specifically said no one was as if like if the discussion was had, he was going to say no and he was going to be on the field. Yeah, it seemed like maybe that sort of a discussion happened. He, he, he quickly mentioned Bean as like a guy who couldn't keep him off the field. He didn't like say Brandon Bean didn't want me to play, but you know there there was some something along those lines. I found it interesting that that Miller kind of approached it as I'm on the back end of my career. I want to take all the chances I can. And look, if he says now that he should not have been on the field, you'd want a guy. If there's anyone on this team who should understand whether they should be on the field, it's the guy that has the most experience. The guy that's had the most reps, been on the field the most, had the most responsibility. And the the fact that he's almost putting himself ahead of the team there, you could make the argument. And I don't want to stir something up because it's not worth it. But essentially, if I'm reading this correctly, he said that I wanted to play because I don't have many years left, even though, looking back at least, he said he shouldn't have been on the field. I think another part of this, and he talked about this, his optimistic mindset. Obviously, we've all seen this in the uh, you know his interviews and things like that. When you're going through that, I'm sure in his mind, he's like, okay, last week was not a great week. The next week, it's going to be it. It's going to be there. I'm going to get there. So I think big picture, he's able to, um, you know, hindsight 2020, be like, okay, I should have been out there. I don't get the sense that last year he was waking up on a Tuesday morning like, I don't think I'm going to have it this week, but I'm still going to give it my best. I think he was like, okay, this is my week. This is my time. Let's do this thing. Let's go. So... I don't think it uh, is as far as, you know, maybe that his, his talks could imply in terms of you know, being saying. detrimental yeah. to the team. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think just with a little hindsight, he kind of realized, okay, I was 34 years old coming off a second ACL recovery. Maybe I was a little out there. The relentless optimism has gotten him in trouble in front of a microphone, and maybe that's, you know, what got him in a little bit of trouble, you know, last year trying to push through when now, like you said, and I agree, I don't think he was, you know, going out there. The one thing I will say, though, I don't think he was trying to play when he knew he shouldn't. I would want someone at that level to understand where they really are at. Mm. I totally respect the idea that he is super positive and and thinks good things are going to happen. That's absolutely, I think, the mindset people should have. But you've been in the league for a while. You should be able to understand where you're really at. Separate of that, he apparently is uh, not facing any more charges in terms of the domestic violence case that happened in Texas last season around Thanksgiving, correct? Yeah, it was, it was the last question he got at the press conference today. He just said, yep, the, uh, no charges are being filed. The case is closed. Uh, you know, kind of it's in the past, and, and now he's ready to attack the season. I'm not sure if that will totally absolve him of NFL discipline. I don't think there would be anything, uh, but the league has before suspended players for, for being a part of cases like that. I, I still would think he probably would be outside of suspensions. Yeah, if, I, if I had head. to put my money, yeah. I, I, I don't see it rising to that. And, and we could talk about this for about an hour, whether or not that's right or not. For sure. All right, separately, Joe Brady also addressed the media today. And one thing that we've noticed in camp here, and you're going to hear more about this if you uh, watch News 8 later tonight or check out rochesterfirst.com later Which today. Which you will. Absolutely. Is when the offense scores a touchdown, they like to celebrate. And they like to celebrate big. We had Justin Shorter yesterday launching a ball <laughs> towards 490, almost making it there after a touchdown. We had the old tight end scores, hands it off to the offensive lineman for a spike. These guys have been going all out. 
when it comes to how they react to a touchdown in practice. Yeah, and it's a very clear Joe Brady thing. This is something he wanted to do. This is something he implemented right when he took over as offensive coordinator, interim offensive coordinator in the last year. In fact, he said that before that Jets game where he first took over, the offensive line were being winded in practice because during red zone drills, they'd have to run and go to Dawson Knox or Dalton Kincaid or whoever and go celebrate that touchdown with them. So I think it's a good mindset. You know, how much of effect does it really have? Who knows? But I mean, Joe Brady talked about it. You know, the fact that you want to practice like you play, things like that. I've seen clips about Bill Belichick talking about this where, you know, you want to celebrate with your teammates. Scoring a touchdown is really hard in the NFL against whoever it is, so celebrate those wins. I think it's a good mindset to have, and uh, it's, it's certainly been fun to watch. I don't think celebrating touchdowns is going to have an impact on the season. But to me what this is about is you want to build, A, a positive mindset with the team where, where you amplify and – really make sure everybody notices the positives. And B, you just want to make it fun. You want guys to enjoy coming to work every day. And by allowing your team, by encouraging, by almost forcing your team to celebrate with each other, to make a big deal out of the touchdowns, you're accomplishing both those two things. And as a part of the entire culture you're trying to build on the offense, I like where Joe Brady's going with that. Especially in a season which we're, you know we've talked about it yesterday, we're gonna talk about it again. So much turnover, things like that. Anything you can do to get some of that cohesion, some uh, you know continuity, things like that, uh, definitely a positive. All right, time for turkey burgers every single day after practice. <coughs> we will point out a couple of guys who had either good plays or a good day, and I will go first today. My, my favorite one so far of camp, we're only two days in, is Kenny H. Lovely, reserve defensive back, who absolutely smothered K.J. Hamler on a deep ball, made a play. There weren't any interceptions today, so this was the height of defensive plays. And look, you can't draw up coverage more lovely than the way Kenny H. Lovely did on this play. So Turkey Burger for number 38 today. I'm going to go to another reserve defensive back to Corey Couch. Had a really nice pass breakup on, uh, on Curtis Samuel. Kind of floated in to Samuel on the far side. Stayed with the play, got in it, got his helmet right on there. I know Carl Jones would have uh, appreciated mm -hmm. that play if he was there at practice today. I'm going to give one to uh, Mr. Couch there. I'm going to give a turkey burger to Javon Solomon, the rookie defensive end. I sat down and talked with him today, and you're going to hear more about that in the next few days as well on News 8 and here on Buffalo Camp Day Recap. Great guy to talk to you, but the thing that impressed me today as I was watching him in practice, it's a rookie, so you understand it, but when guys go through drills, the over and over, we're going to hit the sleds, we're going to do the same move against the coach over and over, I don't want to say guys stroll, but there's certainly a, a – reserve pace that players use to go through drills when it's your turn you step up at a comfortable pace you you go and when you know when it's your time you're ready to go but no one's overzealous mm -hmm. Javon Solomon when it is his turn to go he is hustling 100% to get in a position he is ready to go the absolute earliest moment he can be ready and he is going to make sure that he can do everything he can do to be in the right spot doing what he's supposed to do in drills and again, you expect it out of a first-year player or a rookie. I was still impressed because it is consistent. It is every single rep. And it's the type of thing that coaches love. And maybe that gives you 30 snaps in the first preseason game exactly. instead of 25. And who knows what that, uh, those extra five snaps can do for you. Finally, uh, Curtis Samuel gets the easy one today for his plays that he made today. A really nice step after a quieter day one of, uh, of practice. A good sign for Curtis Samuel today. I'm going to slide one in for Josh Allen, too. I know it's easy to give the starting quarterback a turkey burger. But the throw he made to Samuel over the middle, where, again, we talked about it before, moving to his right, throwing to his left, to his receiver going left. Look, he made it look easy, and that's a throw that only maybe Patrick Mahomes in the league can make at least as well and as consistently as Josh Allen does. And we may take it for granted here in Western New York, but it was absolutely an elite 11 out of 10 quarterback highlight. So Turkey Burger for Josh Allen. Let's give one to Shane Bouchel then. To, uh, B Bouchel. You can give it to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Back he had another great throw. Uh, the third stringer uh, was to Hollins, correct? Was his, correct. his, his diamond no, no, there? No, no, that was Terrell Shavers. Okay, to, to Terrell Shavers. Over, over one player down low. Uh, in front of another. In front of another. Yeah. Really nice dropping in there. We'll give two to the quarterbacks today. Bouchelles was not as good as Josh Allen's because 
well, it's Josh Allen. Yeah. But and they were both they were both turkey burger worthy. I agree with that. We'll take it. All right. As always, you can check out Buffalo Camp Day recap at RochesterFirst.com on YouTube and wherever you find your podcasts. We'll be back again tomorrow. Practice number three. Three in a row to begin things here at camp. Don't believe pads are coming on tomorrow. I would no. I would think it's going to be on Sunday at the earliest. So at least one more day of helmets and shorts, and then maybe maybe we will get some real football. For AJ Feldman, I'm Thad Brown. Thanks as always for watching and listening, and we will see you again tomorrow.